Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with a report that is doing the rounds from Bloomberg. The website are reporting that multiple sources over at Nintendo have detailed their plans for the Switch, and we will apparently see two Switch models launched this year, but it's not quite what we've seen the Nikai report last week. Bloomberg are reporting that we will see two Switch models, the first of which is a lighter variant of the system, which is going to launch around the June period. We will also see a slightly upgraded, they're using the word modest upgrade, for the current Switch. Now, if I had to run with the idea of modest upgrade, we can probably say a die-shrunk variant of the processor that's currently in the system. Most likely, that will improve battery life and the other bits and pieces. I don't think it's going to be like, hey, the GPU clock's like 50% faster. They are reporting, though, that currently there are no plans to release a more powerful variant of the Switch, and Nintendo are currently, you know, not even sure if they're going to do that. This is contrary to what we heard last week, where the Nakai, along with a few other reports, were telling us that yes, there would be a, you know, lighter variant of the Switch, which is designed for more portable usage scenarios, although according to their sources, you can still plug it into your television, you can still dock it somehow or another, but there would indeed be a more powerful version of the Switch, although we don't know what the specifications are. Frankly, I would be shocked if Nintendo don't release a more powerful version of the Switch, it could be they don't really know where an upgraded version of the Switch would lie against the new consoles from both Sony and Microsoft. We're going to discuss some information from those uh, companies in just a moment. For example, the good thing about the Switch is that while it is much weaker than the base model Xbox One, it's still powerful enough to run titles like, let's say, Ports of Doom. And that's pretty critical because it's one of the selling points of the Switch, right? But... Let's say the next generation systems are like two or three times the current base Xbox One minimum, and most likely it's going to be much more than that, let's just be honest, including drastically beefed up CPUs. Maybe Nintendo are kind of scratching their head and like, well, is that actually a good idea to release? Because maybe ports would not be possible. Right now, it's very difficult to know what Nintendo are planning internally. And it's possible that they are speaking to games developers and having them kind of weigh in on the on their plans, which, once again, all we can do is kind of wait and watch this space. I am fascinated, though, for the lighter variant of the Switch. Um, having a more portable variant would be definitely cool. If it's produced on a, a shrunken process, let's say on the 12 or 16 nm FinFET process from TSMC, which would be a pretty good bet, we can see drastically improved battery life, which obviously is going to be critical for a mobile uh, console. Although, of course, the Switch can be used for several hours on battery. Let's face it, if you can extend that battery life 20, 30, 40, 50%, whatever they manage to achieve, that's only going to be a selling point for us as customers. Now let's move over to some PlayStation 5 uh, information. The first of which is actually a tweet from one of the employees over at Naughty Dog. And this tweet's rather interesting because the user who made it, Boone Cotter, actually backtracked on his statement. In his initial tweet, he said, hardware ray tracing, that is all. But later on, he somewhat backtracked and said, well, I actually don't know anything about the hardware. It's just that it's logical for it to be hardware ray tracing for the PlayStation 5. After all, we can do software ray tracing technically right now on the current generation of systems, which is technically true. I mean, you can do that on uh, either the Xbox One or the PlayStation 4. You could do it by asynchronous compute. But I think he kind of did an oopsie. Uh, this is my opinion, and obviously I don't know what information he knows behind the scenes. But first of all, he works at Naughty Dog, and let's just be honest, Naughty Dog, it's not like they wouldn't have access to certain information from Sony. You also have to take into consideration that Naughty Dog works hand-in-hand -hand with the ICE team, which are one of the most important aspects of PlayStation software development. They basically make the tools which allow uh, games developers to really optimise and get the most out of PlayStation 4 hardware. So I think he kind of got overexcited and now is trying to backpedal. So a few days ago, you might recall I put out a video 
And at the very end of it, I said that I am actually working on a PlayStation 5 analysis. And that's still true. It's actually around 12 pages of script right now. No, I'm not kidding. And I'm not even slightly finished because I've actually found a lot of extra information that I'm plonking in to the script. In fact, I'm probably going to have to split it up now into a couple of videos. But while I've been doing some digging, I did want to reveal a few things that I have found interesting over the past several days. One of them actually concerns the PlayStation VR, the updated PlayStation VR headset that we've already seen patents for from Sony. Now, you might recall this updated headset, along with other features, uh, includes eye trackers. Basically, what these do, of course, is keep an eye uh -huh, uh, mm, God, on what your uh, iris is actually doing. So is it looking to the right? Is it looking to the left? Is it looking up and down? And there's actually multiple reasons for that to exist. But one of them actually is really interesting from a graphical standpoint. If you watch my Intel XE slash Gen 11 discussion, you might have heard me discuss foveated rendering, and there's a couple of different tiers for this. Now, what's really interesting is Sony have a couple of patents which essentially point to the fact that their hardware for the PlayStation 5 is actually analysing what your eyes are doing. And from doing that, what it can do is the cones that are in your eyes, the fovea, are basically the sensitive part. So let's say, you know, your peripheral vision, when you're looking at something from your peripheral vision, it's a lot harder to actually make out the fine details. So, I mean, you can try this yourself. You can hold, like, something that you can read, like a, a book or something like that, and try and read it from your peripheral vision, and then move that then to your, you know, to the center of your vision. And you can see it's clearly so much easier to read things when your eyes are focused on that particular object. Once again, I've gone much deeper into this in the Intel Gen 11 uh, slash Intel XE discussion. But the reason that this is really important is because then you can actually harness the GPU processing power of a system where you basically need it. So for example, let's say objects that fall in your peripheral vision, let's say for the sake of argument, you're looking at, I don't know, a, a hillside uh, with at the bottom you've got some woods and other bits and pieces and to the left you've maybe got a couple of trees and maybe to the right there's a I don't know like a cottage or something like that so imagine though the trees to your extreme left and the cottage to your extreme right they would fall in your peripheral vision so you're not actually looking at those things with lots and lots of detail so what you could do as a games developer you would set flags on the engine to be like, well, hey, anything that's falling within the peripheral vision of this user, we can essentially shade it, in other words, render it, draw it, whatever you want to call it, um, at lower details. And so you wouldn't really be able to perceive that as the user. I mean, technically speaking, if you were to take a still image of it and then you were to analyze it uh, afterwards and like actually you know look at the whole thing kind of going like that through you could certainly see it rendered at lower resolution or lower quality at certain aspects certain areas but the overall image when you're when you're actually viewing it and playing it it wouldn't be like that which is really interesting there's also another very interesting pattern i've discovered and that is labeled attention-based ai through player choice but it uses once again the position of your eye to figure out what you are looking at in keystone scenes, tag locations of objects, image, player, to track gaze direction. In other words, once again, it's looking at what your eyes are doing. Correlate to objects in the game, based on object update count score, and then based on count score, modify game execution. So essentially, you're establishing the game path, and then according to what you're looking at in theory, the game can change accordingly. The abstract is, Using a camera or other hardware or other tracking hardware, the attention of a player of a computer game based on gaze direction, for instance, is tracked at key slash predetermined points during the gameplay. For example, when the player enters a new area in the game, such as a simulated room, town, etc., it is determined what the player gaze focuses on. Example, a dog huddled with its in the corner, a nobleman with the obvious signs of wealth, or a, sh or a shifty appearing figure in the shadows. Based on this input, one or more factors of the future gameplay are determined, such as the order of what the 
present encounters, challenges, adjusting player morality, scores slash flags, adjusting bonus penalties for non-player characters, interactions, and so on. Another reason this is super duper interesting, at least in my personal opinion, is because you might also recall that there are some leaks concerning the PlayStation 5 having deep learning capabilities. So when you add all of these different things together, it really does start to paint some type of picture in your mind of maybe what we're going to be seeing for the PlayStation 5. Naturally, just because that this is a pattern, it does not mean it's going to be a real technology that we're going to see implemented on the PlayStation 5. But still, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some type of implementation based on this. So what about Xbox Scarlet? Do you think that I've forgotten you? Oh no, no. I actually have several pieces of information regarding the next generation Xbox as well. The first of which are code names. And these code names are not Anaconda and Lockhart, which refer to the two variants of the system. Once again, Anaconda being the more powerful and Lockhart supposedly being the weaker of the two SKUs. But what we do have is code names for the APUs. Now, obviously, this stuff, once again, is not confirmed, but several sources have been talking about this particular uh, set of code names. We have Arden, which seems to be in reference to the Anaconda sock, and Argolus, which is in reference most likely to the Lockhart sock. Also, while I'm on the subject of Xbox Anaconda, there was that supposed leak we had of the development kit, which basically went over some of the specifications from what appeared to be a boot screen slash BIOS screen. And there were several key things that we learned about the system, assuming it's accurate. But the main one was the amount of level 4 cache, which was reading as 1 gigabyte of memory. Now, there's a really interesting pattern that a number of you actually messaged me about, so thanks to everyone who did. And this is basically what can be described as a stacked die. Now, these uh, several stacks of DRAM are connected via an interposer to the GPU slash CPU cores. So that's quite interesting in and of itself. But there's also a couple of other small things for the Xbox that I want to discuss in this video as well. I've also found a couple of patents regarding variable rate shading and various implementations for, uh, sorry, from Microsoft. Now these were filed late last year, which was 2018 December, slash early this year, which is January of 2019. Now, this is really interesting to me because variable rate shading, we know, is a feature of Narve. Uh, once again, we saw a patent from AMD themselves concerning this. You can't necessarily say that um, VSR in relation to the Microsoft patents necessarily uh, refers to the Xbox because Microsoft do uh, also uh, handle things such as PC gaming and DirectX so there is that possibility as well but I did want to bring it to your attention. There will be a much more in-depth analysis for the PlayStation 5 and the next generation Xbox over the next several days. I am working on it. Once again I just decided I wanted to really go crazy on the script, and so I'm doing a lot more research than what I had originally anticipated in terms of the complexity of this. I had originally expected it just to be kind of an overview, but I actually sh sent the script to a couple of people and they said, hey, this is great. Uh, what about this, though? Uh, you know, and then they were kind of coming back to me with questions. I'm like, you know what? I actually don't know about that. And then I started to do some research. So now it's kind of getting a little bigger than what I had anticipated. And yes, that is what she said. With all of that said, though, if you've enjoyed the video, you know what to do. You can subscribe to the channel and there will be a lot more stuff coming up. And you can also like the video because that helps us out a ton. You can also comment down below as well to uh, tell us what you want out of the next generation systems. And you can also find us on the social medias linked in the description. And you can also find us on Patreon and some Amazon affiliate links. If you decide to uh, help support the channel, that would be greatly appreciated. And hey, if you need to buy, I don't know, a new lawnmower or something, then you can use Amazon affiliate links. And it doesn't cost you an extra penny, but it does help us out some as well. But take care of yourselves. Bye for now. <laughs>